Good day. In my programme yesterday, I mentioned that a large Russian missile strike seemed to be underway against Ukraine and that I would do an assessment of it today. And as it turns out, this was indeed a big Russian missile strike, though not actually the largest, despite some claims to the contrary. Now, the Ukrainians claim, and it's the only the Ukrainians who provided us with any figures, so we have to work with those. The Ukrainians claim that 72 cruise missiles were launched, apparently from Russian aircraft. They were air-launched cruise missiles. And four other shorter-range missiles of an indeterminate nature were also launched against Ukraine, making a grand total of 76 missiles. They also claim to have shot down most of these missiles. This is a claim the Ukrainians repeatedly make. As I understand it, they claim to have shot down 60 out of these 76 missiles, which were supposedly launched against Ukraine. By the way, for what it's worth, that is a slightly less impressive um, percentage of sh shot down missiles than some we've had from the Ukrainians on previous occasions. Well, I'm sceptical about these Ukrainian claims of the number of missiles that they claim to have shot down. I'm not denying that they probably do shoot down on a fairly regular basis some of these missiles that get launched at them. But as Brian Boletic has explained in a masterly overview of this particular missile attack, which, by the way, can be applied to other missile attacks as well, the amount of damage on the ground is simply not consistent with Ukrainian claims that only a small number of missiles supposedly got through. Um, now, I say that because though the Ukrainians this time are careful not to tell us how many targets were actually struck by these missiles, they've done so in the past and ended up claiming that more uh, targets were hit than missiles which supposedly, cruise missiles which supposedly got through, a fact which led to questions about the credibility of their claims. Well, in this case, they haven't done that. They haven't provided us with that kind of information. But what we can see is lots of evidence across Ukraine of lots of targets hit, massive damage done, and um, widespread problems across Ukraine with the electricity, the power generating system. And I've noticed, by the way, that this time, in contrast to what was the case with the previous missile strike, not even the Western media, at least not even the West British media, is trying to pretend that the effects of this strike were anything less than devastating. They're not saying on this occasion that the missile strike was less effective than earlier ones because supposedly uh, so many of the missiles had been shot down. I've noticed that this time they're more willing to accept the scale of the damage, probably because some of the missiles were launched at facilities in Kiev, and it is impossible to conceal, either from the uh, Ukrainian population in Kiev, or indeed from the journalists, the Western journalists who are located there, the scale of the damage done. Now, I'm not going to say much more than this, I will just make, make one observation which perhaps gives an indicator of the scale of the damage better than anything else, which is that apparently the internet across Ukraine, as is regularly the case when these missile attacks take place, the internet was severely degraded, and this was one of the worst of those instances when essentially the internet across most of Ukraine practically stopped working. So there we go, a devastating attack carried out by the Russians. No sign, as I've said before, that the Russians are running out of missiles. Lots of speculation about the size of their stock of missiles. Lots of speculation about the quantity of production, uh, Russian production of their missiles. We can speculate about that. 
until uh, you know doomsday comes um, without more information from the Russians. It is only speculation. The facts that we know point to continued heavy missile strikes of this nature taking place um, at least twice a month, sometimes more often, and of course missile strikes taking place as well over the course of the week as the Russians carry out missile strikes as they have done, by the way, throughout the war against individual Ukrainian military targets. Those are not part of these big missile offensives that we are seeing. No sign of any slackening in the scale of Russian missile attacks, at least not for the moment. And Brian Boletic says that the Ukrainians themselves have admitted that up to the Russians have launched around 1,000 missiles since they began this missile offensive in October. And I read somewhere else, though I can't confirm this, and this figure may um, add to n missile numbers, not just cruise missiles, but other types of missiles. But anyway, I read somewhere that the Russians have launched 4,500 missiles in total over the course of this war since February. That, as I said, may not be quite a comparable figure, but let's put that aside. The fact is we see no sign of this missile offensive slackening or slowing down if the Russians are indeed running out of missiles where there is no sign of it. And I would, by the way, say on the subject of Russian production of missiles that, again, I've had a very um, important and interesting email from a private source, the identity of which I cannot, I'm not going to confirm or provide any clues to, saying to, save to say that this person is somebody who on this topic most emphatically does know what he's talking about. He has the uh, technological engineering background which enables him to speak properly about this kind of subject, which of course the vast majority of commentary that you hear from various people, um, well, they, they don't seem to be able to um, discuss that in any detail because, frankly, they're not people who have either experience of technology or of the production side of things. And this person made the point that the Russians have all the technological skills to build missiles um, of this nature. They've actually been developing and building cruise missiles for a very long time and all the technology that goes with building the jet engines, the guidance systems, the necessary alloys that you would need for these kind of systems and putting them all together. And this person said that my previous guesstimate, and I want to make it clear it's a guesstimate, it's more a guess even, uh, that the Russians could be producing a hundred perhaps even more of these things every month. Uh, this person thought that that was by no means far-fetched. It was actually possible. Let me stress again, that's a guesstimate. It might be more. It might be less. I don't know. But to repeat again, to re reinforce the point that I made previously, there is no visible sign of the Russians running out of missiles. Now, in that same video that I've just been talking about, uh, Brian Boletic returns to that point, uh, the point that I made previously, uh, rather that we discussed previously, about these interviews that General Zaluzhny and General Skirsky and um, the rest have given to the British media about the state of Ukraine's armed forces and about the equipment and ammunition shortages that the Ukrainians are experiencing and their difficulties of sustaining offensives without all of that equipment. I discussed all that 
in detail yesterday and about the fact that the Russians are planning some big offensive, that there's some dispute whether it will be in January or February, and where it might be targeted at, whether it be at Kiev or somewhere else. Anyway, all of that, um, and Brian Boletic made the point, it's an entirely valid one, that he has been talking about the problems the West has in keeping up with Ukraine's voracious demands for military equipment, which are on a scale and of an intensity that Western powers have never anticipated, clearly never anticipated, and with which they simply cannot keep up. And let me repeat, Brian Boletic has been saying this for months, and events are proving him right. And, of course, he mentioned... Um, Zaluzhny's request or demand for 300 tanks, was it 600 or 700 infantry fighting vehicles, 500 howitzers, and that this is an absolutely almost fantastical request for weapon systems. But given the character of the war, it would simply be burnt up if that number of weapon systems were supplied. Um, it would be burnt up incredibly fast and the Ukrainians would end up in that situation after a few weeks or months of coming back to the West and de demanding or insisting on more numbers of systems, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, howitzers, you name it. They would be start demanding more of those uh, be supplied to them um, despite this huge number that they had already been supplied with. In other words, they would run through at lightning speed whatever weapon systems the West gave them. Now, why am I bringing all this up again? Because for the first time in Britain, Britain, which has been at the forefront of this war, we are starting to see the first hints of possible concern about this. And the first, I'm not going to say hints or even suggestions of a change of policy, but at least maybe the first signs of doubt. The British government, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, apparently himself, has now instructed that what is called an audit of what, of where the Ukrainian war is going, he's asked for that to be provided. Now, I should say this is a misconception. It's not an audit. We're not talking about some kind of financial analysis of the state of the war. At least that's not my understanding of it. Um, this is a British government bureaucratic phrase. It's essentially a report and a review of the actual military realities. What, not just military, logistical, economic, all of those things. And it's something, by the way, that the British government does, or is supposed to do. I don't know how much, how often it does do it, but anyway, it, there is an actual procedure for this, which is part of the normal mechanism of government in Britain. Um, once upon a time, this kind of thing used to happen fairly regularly. I suspect it happens less often today. But this is not by any means an unorthodox or unusual um, procedure that Sunak, the Sunak cabinet, has just ordered. Now, let me make it very clear. I'm not making any predictions that any of this is going to lead to any sort of change of policy. I don't expect, for example, Rishi Sunak to come out and say, well, sent all these weapon systems to Ukraine, we sent all this money to Ukraine, it's all gone to waste, nothing has been achieved, the war is failing, Ukraine is losing, the time has come for us to cut our losses and, well, walk away. We're not going to get anything like that from Sunak or from the British government. Quite likely, this review is going to be made, it's going to be kept confidential. We're never going to see it. It's going to be provided to the cabinet and to no one else. 
and that will be the last we hear of this. Policy will remain exactly the same as it is now. Um, the British government is far too weak and uh, Sunak's position as Prime Minister is far too fragile for him to take on the British establishment on this policy with respect to Ukraine, um, given the enormous momentum, if you like, behind this policy in Britain of supporting Ukraine. But having said that, what is interesting about this information that this report has now been commissioned is two things. Firstly, someone has leaked the fact to the media, not perhaps entirely surprising, but secondly, the reports, the media reports, the British media reports that have come with that leak. We learn that across Whitehall, there is enormous concern about this review. I'll call it a review rather than an audit. There's worries that the review might indicate a slackening of support, a reduction of support for Ukraine. Now, bear in mind, as I said, this is just a review. It's not any sort of policy paper. And as I said, it's a review that has been requested by ministers, British ministers, which is, as I said, a standard procedure. And yet already we're seeing what are in effect warnings being made publicly in the media, and lots of parts of the British media are reporting all of this, warnings in effect that this could change government policy, that government policy towards in support of Ukraine might slacken off, which are in effect warnings against government policy with respect to Ukraine slackening off. Now, I have to say, all of this is really extraordinary, and I think we shouldn't let ourselves become too accustomed to forget how extraordinary this kind of thing is. First of all, is it not normal? Is it not entirely proper for a government that has committed itself to a highly expensive and in some ways dangerous policy of committing Britain to support a party in a war, is it not normal for the British government to seek a review to find out how the war is going and um, what is actually happening? One would have thought that this was an absolutely normal thing for a government to do. Indeed, a proper thing for the government to do. After all, if they're not going to conduct these periodic reviews from time to time, well, presumably, they will cease to have that proper, clear understanding of the state of the war, the state of the commitment that Britain, Britain is making to the war, the investments, if you like, that Britain is making in the war, that the British government should have. So that's the first thing to say. Apparently, it's somehow improper even for the British government to take, to take a step back, take stock and ask for a review of how British weapons, British money, British taxpayers' money is being used in this war. It's doing so is creating alarm that... British support for Ukraine is slackening. That's the first thing. But there's the other thing which I find absolutely astonishing, and that's this reference to Whitehall, which I've seen in a number of um, a number of articles. Now, Whitehall is a street in London where many British government ministries are located, but it is also a metonym for the British permanent state, for the bureaucracy, the civil service, if you like. So, that suggests that the people who are most concerned about this, I don't know this for a fact, by the way, but this is, 
the appearance of these articles suggest not British ministers or British politicians who are worried about the fact that support for Ukraine is slackening. It is civil servants, the permanent state, the deep state, if you prefer. Now, I say all of that because once upon a time, long ago, in a galaxy far away, but which I remember from my time working on the fringe of the British civil service bureaucracy, if you like, the function of civil servants was not to make policy, but to brief ministers, to advise ministers and to execute the policies that ministers had decided upon. And that was absolutely and emphatically the case when the policy involved an issue of war or peace. And yet that reference to the word Whitehall <laughs> appears to suggest that some members of Britain's permanent state, its civil service, if you like, are unhappy that the Prime Minister and ministers are asking for a review and that they are worried that this might lead to some kind of change in the policy that they are supporting. Now, I have to say I found that very extraordinary and very disturbing, but it does remind me, I must say this, of Colonel Windman, the American official who was working for the National Security Council, who was a leading figure in the first impeachment of Donald Trump, and who complained angrily that Donald Trump's policies to, uh, with respect to Ukraine were somehow violating the agreed policy of something that Vindman called the interagency. It looks like, I don't know this for a fact, but it looks like we have a similar interagency, if you like, in Britain, and it's not happy because a review of the war is being carried out, even though the ammunition shortages, the weapon shortages, the problems on the battlefields that General Zaluzhny is talking about might suggest that such a review is essential. And all the more so, given that General Zaluzhny's demands for more weapons, 300 tanks, six to 700 infantry fighting vehicles, 500 howitzers, are apparently insatiable and growing all the time. Anyway, that's where I am on this. I just wanted to mention all of this. I don't, as I said, want to make more of this story than I should. Perhaps I'm devoted more time to it than I should have done because, but then, you know, I'm British. <laughs> it's something that's close to my heart, if you like, because this is my country. So I'm just mentioning the, these rather strange and curious reports which seem to me to be so unlike the way British government used to work in the days, in days which I still remember. Anyway, let's get on to more, to bigger topics. There's been less news from the battlefields, but there has been some. And um, there's a report appearing yesterday that the Russians have captured uh, a place called, I think it's called Vodyanoye. I'm probably getting that name wrong or mispronouncing it in some ways. But it's apparently it's an important settlement near, uh, um, near Donetsk City on the sort of Avdivka front. It suggests that the Russian advance towards Avdivka is still continuing. Um, possibly the battle for this place is not yet fully ended. Uh, no doubt there will be Ukrainian counterattacks. There usually are. No doubt it will take some time for the Russians to fully consolidate their control of this place, but it still seems that the Russians are advancing in this precise area. And we have also got 
more reports this time around Bakhmut, that battle, the biggest battle, in my opinion, of the war. And um, there are reports that more Ukrainian reinforcements have been sent to this area. More attempts are being made by Ukraine to rotate um, units that have been badly shattered in the fighting with fresh units. Um, um, the battle for Bakhmut, in other words, continues. Ukraine is not giving up, despite the fact that it's clear that they're losing ground in Bakhmut, that they're suffering incredibly heavy losses in Bakhmut. And as I said, as I discussed a few days ago um, in one of my other programs, there's talk of a pincer movement gradually taking place, the Russians launching a pincer movement towards Bakhmut with the intention of completely uh, encircling, trapping the remaining Ukrainian defenders in the town and essentially repeating the Mariupol scenario in Bakhmut. Now, as I said, I find that remarkable. Back in the fighting um, in the summer in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, the Ukrainians did at the last moment pull their troops out of those towns. They had to leave a lot of heavy equipment behind, but they did pull their troops out. They did preserve at least the bulk of their troops in that particular battle. But this time, it seems that they're taking the opposite course. And I have to say, I find that extraordinary. I find that uh, um, deeply disturbing. We're hearing all kinds of reports about the huge level of casualties. And I'd seen a report some days ago about hospitals in Kiev um, having to turn away patients, uh, apparently because they were their, their resources were completely tied up trying to treat injured soldiers from the battlefields with suggestions that most of them were coming from Bakhmut. I wasn't sure whether this report was true. It seemed too extraordinary to be true. But I've now seen what look like actual documents, and they seem to be real documents from these hospitals, announcements from these hospitals in Kiev, far from the battle lines, which appear to confirm that this is actually true. So the Ukrainians continue to invest, they continue to send troops to fight in Bakhmut, despite the fact that General Zeluzhny admits that he's running out of equipment, despite the fact that he's effectively admitted that he has only 200,000 troops who are combat trained, as opposed to the 700,000 he says are in uniform, despite the fact that he talks about the Ukrainian military bleeding, he's nonetheless prepared, and President Zelensky are nonetheless, is nonetheless prepared to go on defending Bakhmut. I do wonder what they think is going to happen that is going to turn this all round, whether they are gambling that the West in some form is going to come to their rescue. That seems to me the only way that they could turn the situation round in some way, or whether perhaps, given General Zeluzhny's reference to Mannerheim, uh, the Finnish general who told the Finnish troops back in March 1940 that they had to capitulate because they'd been overwhelmed in the war that Finland then fought against the Soviet Union. I wonder whether General Zeluzhny might be accepting these losses in Bakhmut, perhaps one day to prepare the ground for something like that. I don't know, and I have to say what I know about General Zeluzhny and the fact that he appears to share the ferocious ideology, if I can put it like that, of some of some other Ukrainians, uh, well, that would suggest that he's probably not of a compromising or surrendering sort. But who knows? I can't explain this. But anyway, it goes on. The Ukrainians continue to do 
General Surovikin's job for him. They send their troops, their fresh troops, into the meat grinder. Horrible word, but as I said, I'm having to adopt it. Everybody now uses it, including the Western media, by the way, the meat grinder of Bachmann. And he seems to be feeding his troops into that meat grinder, as Zelensky also is. And as I said, Z Surovikin must be satisfied <laughs> with the way things are shaping up there. Now, that brings me to something else, something that's happened today, which is really extremely interesting. When I say today, I should properly say yesterday, um, um, on Friday, which is that President Putin attended in somewhere in Russia, one presumes, a meeting of what the Kremlin website refers to as the joint staff of the military branches involved in the special military operation. And the Kremlin's um, readout of what happened is extremely short, and it says this. Um, the president spent all day on Friday working at the joint staff of the military branches involved in the special military operation. The head of state was briefed about the work of the joint staff and on the progress made in the special military operation, held a general meeting and separate meetings with commanders. Last is quite interesting. Now, TASS has also provided a report, and it's based on what Peskov, which is who's Putin's secret, uh, uh, press officer, press spokesman, has said, and it doesn't take us much further, but it says this. Uh, President Putin visited the joint staff of all military branches involved in Russia's special military operation in Ukraine, the Russian president's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, said, and then we have the Quote from Peskov, on Friday, President Vladimir Putin worked in the joint staff of military branches involved in the special military operation. The head of state examined the staff's work, was briefed about the special military operations progress, held the conference and separate meetings with commanders. Now, going back to some of my earlier videos of a few weeks ago, I spoke about how during the Second World War, uh, the leader of Russia of that time, the leader of the Soviet Union, of course, uh, Joseph Stalin, basically ran the war with two committees. One was the State Defense Committee, which basically had an overall supervisory role of the running of the Soviet the Soviet home front, the uh, um, home economy, um, it, it, it was the place which decided on weapons production, tank production, all that kind of thing. And the other was a committee known as Stavka. I call it a committee because that's what it was. Stavka was a committee which brought together the heads, the leaders of the military leadership and Stalin, and which together planned the various battles um, which the Soviet Union fought over the course of the Second World War. So Stalin had a committee that was dealt with civilian questions, the home front, and he had another committee, Stavka, which basically ran the military affairs. And I said that perhaps without exact understanding Putin, the Russians, seem to be reverting to the same pattern. Now, I should say, by the way, in parenthesis, that given what an intensely historically minded place Russia is, I would personally be surprised if the two committees that Putin has set up, the one, the coordinating committee, which is dealing with the civilian economy, and this joint staff 
headquarters or whatever it's called, the joint staff of the troops involved in the military operation. I suspect there's an acronym somewhere there. Anyway, I would be very surprised if these are not and were not consciously created um, in imitation of the GKO, the State Defence Committee, and the Stavka of the Second World War. Now, I'm not a huge expert about the military side of these things. Um, this isn't something that I've studied in any deep detail. As I said, if you want to learn about Stavka, and how it functioned. Well, there's lots of books about this. Um, um, John Erickson wrote an important um, history of the Soviet Union and its war in the 1970s, I believe. Uh, he's a British historian. And, of course, the American historian, I think his name is David Glantz, but I may be getting it wrong. I'm not, as I said, a military historian in any form. But he's written vast numbers of books on this topic. Um, and no doubt those discuss Stavka, the war, wartime Stavka, in detail. And, by the way, uh, if you want to go to a website which touches on these things well and has an understanding of them much greater than mine, John Helmer's Dancing with Bears is absolutely the place to go. But anyway, let's just take a step back and look at what we know about the wartime Stavka, Stalin's wartime Stavka. And we find that at the very end of the war, his membership consisted of Stalin himself, Georgi Zhukov, who, along with Stalin, by the way, was the only person who uh, remained a member of Stavka right through the entire war. Um, there were, the membership changed. But he was always there, and he was the deputy commander-in-chief under Stalin, and presumably a kind of informal chair of Stavka when Stalin wasn't there, though I doubt that that happened very often. Anyway, Zhukov, the leading general of the Soviet Union during the Second World War, the man we associate today with the Soviet victories in Moscow and uh, Stalingrad and Berlin. Anyway, Zhukov and General Antonov, who was the de facto chief of staff. General Vasilyevsky, or maybe they were marshals, I don't quite remember, but anyway, Marshal Vasilyevsky, who was a um, uh, the formerly the chief of staff, but who was actually apparently more of a battlefield commander. Uh, Nikolai Bulganin, who was a civilian official, but who was actually carrying out the duties of Minister of Defence, the supposed minister, the, 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 the Minister of Defence was, nominal Minister of Defence was Stalin himself, but it was Bulganin who was actually running things as um, in, the, in the Ministry of Defence, though as I said he was a civilian, the only civilian uh, on Stavka, at the very end of the war, and Nikolai Kuznetsov, who was the um, commander of the Russian Soviet fleet at that time, um, he was a naval officer. So it was essentially Stalin with his key military leaders, Antonov, Zhukov, Vasilyevsky, and of course Kuznetsov. And um, Bulganin was there, as I said, to make sure that the civilian part of the defence ministry, the logistical side, was kept functioning and knew what the military commanders were deciding. Now, I don't know what is the exact membership of this joint staff of the joint staff of military branches involved in the special military operation. But the Russians have published some photographs and there's also a film and, well, there's these, these pictures show uh, Putin visiting this place. We'll come to where it is, where it's located and shortly. But anyway, he, he visits this place, and at one point he's in a conference room. And I noticed that the person 
who was sitting on immediately to his right at one point was none other than Surovikin, who is, of course, the overall commander of the forces involved in this conflict. Now, there is another film. There's actually a film um, in, um, of Putin sitting in a completely different room, this time at a kind of circular table, or it's not even a table, but a circular arena. He's got uh, Shoigu uh, uh, and the defense minister, and Valery Gerasimov, he's also there. He's the chief of the general staff. So they're both there. Um, we don't see Surovikin, but we can hear his voice. <laughs> and um, there's photographs of Surovikin, who seems to be in this second conference room, and he seems to be pointing at something, presumably either a map or a video display or something like that. So he's there. And he seems to be fulfilling, or so it seems to me, in effect, the role of the person who's in overall charge at this headquarters. A position perhaps somewhat analogous to Zhukov's in the Stavka. And, of course, just as um, Stalin in his Stavka had the Antonov, who was the de facto chief of staff, and Vasilyevsky, who was the nominal chief of staff, though, as I said, he was actually more of a battlefield commander. Well, we see that Gerasimov, who is the chief of staff today, he is there participating. And just as Stalin had his minister of defense, uh, Bulganin, or rather de facto minister of defense, Bulganin, who was a civilian present on the Stavka. Well, we see Shoigu, who is also, by the way, a civilian. He's also participating in all of these um, meetings. In fact, we see him in one of the photographs standing next to Surovikin. Uh, Surovikin points, as I said, to this map or display with his pen. It looks like some kind of a marker pen. So... Quite interesting, you know, set up. Where is it happening? We're not told. We're not told anything about the actual physical venue of this meeting, of this place. But I'm going to make a guess that it's probably happened in Moscow. Uh, this is just a guess. I say that because the conference areas that we see in the photos and in the Phil look permanent. They don't look like things that have been put together um, at great speed. And I'm going to make a guess that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Russians built a um, very advanced, very modern looking um, headquarters building for their military, com integrated uh, headquarters building. We very high tech with all kinds of high tech equipment. I'm going to guess that it's there. Now, I say that because Putin attended a meeting of his Security Council the previous day, and that meeting did take place in Moscow. That was on the 16th of December in the Kremlin. And that's an interesting meeting in itself. Again, a very interesting uh, uh, excerpt um, from what Putin said. And in fact, I'll just read it. It says, today we will review current issues of ensuring national security in various spheres, and we will also discuss our interaction with neighbours on certain highly sensitive aspects. Which neighbours, one wonders. And then Putin goes on to say, Mr Lavrov will deliver the report. Please, you have the floor. So that looks as if it's a neighbouring country, and one where Lavrov is the person who is best informed about the nature of the interactions. And that, to my mind, suggests either Turkey or Iran or perhaps both. But this programme is not about that Security Council meeting. 
It is about this much more interesting meeting on February, which lasted, or rather series of meetings, which lasted the whole day um, at this headquarters of the Joint Staff. I'm going to refer to it as the Stavka at the moment. Now, I want to stress this is not exactly analogous to the World War II Stavka. That was a semi-permanent body in charge of the entire armed forces of the Soviet Union as it was then. This staff is, this, 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 this headquarters is basically only concerned with those military units that are participating in the war in Ukraine. But of course, given how, how important that war is, we're talking about a very important and very powerful headquarters indeed. And we see how the structure copies or appears to copy that of the wartime Stavka. And we also see how most probably the meeting took place in Moscow um, as meetings of the wartime Stavka, by the way, also did. Now, what do we know about this meeting? We don't know very much because quite properly the Russians are not telling us anything. I mean, it'd be bizarre if they did. But what we do know, and what we have learned, and the Kremlin and Peskov have both told us this, is that uh, Putin received a briefing about the work of the Joint Staff. So he was told about how this headquarters is functioning. He was given an insight into its actual operation operational structure, its organisation. Um, he was reassured, no doubt, that it is working efficiently and properly. That's something, by the way, that Putin takes very seriously. He's always someone who's interested in management issues, which most Western leaders, in my experience, are not. He was also briefed on the progress made in the special military operation. So he was given and insight into what is actually happening in the war. He was briefed about that. But then we learned that he held a general meeting as well as separate meetings with commanders. And it's quite clear that these were battle, battlefield commanders, people who um, are in the actual command of the Russian troops who are participating in this operation. And they participated in this meeting. They had meetings with Putin. Presumably, Surovikin was present at all times. They briefed, they would have briefed Putin about the state of their troops, the state of events on their battlefield, and about their operational plans. And we're explicitly trolled that this was the case. We haven't, not in these notes that we've seen, but in other places in the Russian media, we're told that Putin was briefed about those plans, the plans of the individual commanders. And we're also told that there was a general meeting, and this is clearly the meeting which is dominated by Surovikin, in which he's pointing at his map or visual display with his pen. And you can hear his voice. He's clearly outlining to Putin some kind of scheme, plan, strategy, who knows what, about the future of the battle. Now, I am not going to speculate further about this, though I can assure you that people in London, Washington, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, and of course, Kiev, they're going to be going into far more detail than I, can, I am or can do, trying to sort of read the tea leaves about what all of this means. But it does look to me like some kind of a council of war and an indication that the Russians are working on some kind of a plan, presumably for their winter offensive, and that the finishing touches are being put to that plan and that Putin is being briefed about it. So it may be that this plan is still a work in progress. It may be that there's still lots to do. Or 
Alternatively, it could be that we're about to see things happen fairly soon. About that, I'm not going to even try and speculate. Um, any speculations I make would have no basis, and I'm not in a position as somebody who's not a military person to make them. But anyway, there we go. That's what we see. And of course, we see something else. And that is that this meeting, which took up a whole day, or rather these series of meetings, the Russians want us to know that these meetings have, have, have actually happened, that they in fact took place. They want to communicate that fact both to the West and, of course, to the Ukrainians. They want us to know that there were these meetings. Now, again, I'm not going to guess or try to guess as to why this was so. Is it, you know, to have us all guessing about what's coming, what the Russians are going to do? Is it in order to scare people in the West? Say, my God, the Russians are all coming together. Surovikin's put his finishing touches to his great master plan. Who knows? But it is interesting that the Russians are telegraphing to the Western powers that a meeting like this is take, took place and um, that some serious matters were discussed and that Putin was briefed not just about the general state of the battle but that he actually had one-to-one -one meetings well, I say one-to-one -one meetings, but there would have been meetings with the individual commanders with Surovikin presumably present throughout. So this is quite a big event, and it may mean, as I said, that this offensive is about to be launched, or it may mean that, as I said, they're still working on their plans, but clearly it does mean something. What exactly, as I said, we will have to work, wait and see. And that brings me now back to the story, non-story actually, about the delays in Putin's address to the Federal Assembly and the, and the fact that he hasn't, he's going to postpone his big press conference until the new year. Well, we now see what is surely the explanation. The Russians working heavily on something of a military nature involving Ukraine. Putin is heavily immersed in those details. He clearly doesn't have the time for press conferences or addresses to the Federal Assembly. And anyway, given that the shape of that press conference and of the address to the Generalist to the Federal Assembly will no doubt be determined by the military developments on the battlefields that will be the product of this meeting or meetings, because I'm guessing that there's been many more than just one. It's premature to hold that press conference and that address to the Federal Assembly anyway. Well, I discussed this at some detail. As I said, there's only a limited amount that I can glean from this, but it is all interesting. And as I said, I am absolutely sure that in the Pentagon, in the British Ministry of Defence, they've been working much harder than me trying to work out what exactly this all means. What have the Ukrainians been doing in the meantime? Well, they do what they always do when they find themselves under pressure, which is intensify their shelling of Donetsk. And this has been going on now for several days, and it's increasingly apparently using multiple rocket launch systems. And I noticed that the Ukrainians, for the first time, are admitting that the shelling is going on, though they are trying to insinuate that it's the Russians, again, who are shelling themselves. But in my experience, Ukrainian shelling of Donetsk tends to intensify whenever the Ukrainians are becoming worried and nervous. And perhaps this meeting and news of that meeting is going to, in Moscow, if it was in Moscow, is going to make them even more nervous 
and that might explain why the shelling is taking place and it might mean that the shelling if anything is going to intensify and in the meantime since i'm talking about ukrainian shelling of particular facilities we also have seen some really rather extraordinary pictures from the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. Now, the Ukrainians have been shelling it on and off for months, a fact which, appallingly, neither the International Atomic Agent Energy Agency nor Western governments have been making any great issue about. In some, the IAEA pretends that it doesn't know who is, in fact, carrying out the shelling, as, of course, it emphatically does do. And... Western governments are tight-lipped on the matter and blame the whole problem on the Russians, even though we've seen leaks to the New York Times, essentially admitting, in fact, not essentially, straightforwardly admitting that it is indeed Ukraine that's been conducting this shelling. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about some kind of protective or safe zone being negotiated by the IAEA around the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant doesn't seem as if these negotiations are going very far um, at various times it's been suggested that the russians should evacuate remove all their troops from this nuclear power plant something the russians have said categorically that they're not going to do anyway the russians seem to be in the process of taking their own steps to harden the power plant there's extraordinary pictures of some great dome being constructed not over the entire power plant that would be a titanic endeavor but um, a dome over some of the storage facilities and this appears to be intended to protect these storage facilities from drones drone attacks and shell fragments and the point is that it's these storage facilities that contain the nuclear material, the release of which might cause a nuclear accident. So my reading of these photos is that the Russians don't actually anticipate an agreement about a protection zone, or at least are not assuming that there will be such an agreement. They have no intention of withdrawing their troops from the nuclear power plant. I never imagined that they would do. And they're taking steps to protect the storage facilities from more Ukrainian shelling and drone attacks because they realize that this is the vulnerable part of the power plant. Again, can't help but think that this is Surovikin making the difference. He's created these fortified lines in all sorts of places. I was reading also today about the very dense fortifications he's const had constructed in, in eastern Kherson region, east of the uh, Dnieper River, specifically very dense fortifications near Novaya Kharkovka, making it it's incredibly difficult for the Ukrainians to advance from there, uh, uh, to try and cross the river and attack the Russians there. I don't think that's a remotely feasible prospect. But anyway, Surovikin is taking no chances. We've learned about the fortifications he's built in the north of Donbass. There's now satellite photos that show how elaborate and powerful these fortifications are. And he's hardening the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant against Ukrainian shelling as well. He is, as I said, bringing to this war a engineer's approach, but also perhaps a combat general's approach. After all, he was one. He has been one in the past. Now, I'm going to finish with one very quick reminder that Surovikin was the general who was in charge of the Russian forces in Syria in 2016 and I believe in 2017 in the early period of the Russian intervention. They're the most difficult. And as I remember, his focus was on 
one thing at that time, which is this siege that was taking place of Aleppo. Aleppo, Syria's biggest city, um, initially encircled by the Islamist insurgency. I'm not going to be too specific about who they were. But um, eventually, um, that siege was flipped so that some of these insurgents ended up themselves being besieged. And a very large force of insurgents was then put together, something like 30,000 men, as I remember, to try and break that siege and capture Aleppo. And there was a huge amount of fighting around Aleppo in 2016. And Surovikin, who was the overall commander of the Russian forces, he focused on breaking that big insurgent force, 30,000 men, that was trying to take Aleppo and essentially win, you know, win a decisive victory there. And he did, he broke it. It took him about, it took him months to do, bombing their supply lines, bombing their uh, positions, but he did eventually break it. And when he did, it was clear that the insurgency had been permanently weakened. And what followed, as I also remember, over the course of 2017, was an extraordinary advance by the Syrian army against very light opposition across the whole of north-central Syria, basically from Aleppo all the way to the eastern city of Deir Ezzor, which up to then had been basically besieged itself by the insurgent army of another radical Islamist group. And I wonder whether something similar isn't being planned. In other words, in Ukraine. In other words, grind down the Ukrainians, break their forward defences, weaken their army uh, uh, permanently, terminally, and then you can carry out your big advance. It would be consistent with what Surovikin did in Syria. It worked then. I'm not sure the situations on the two battlefields, the two wars, are exactly the same. But who knows? Maybe that's the plan. Anyway, that's where I'm going to finish today. Um, Putin, no doubt, has been briefed about it. He knows a lot more about the plan than I do. But anyway, that's that's where we are. And thank you again for joining me today. More from me soon. And um, have a very good day. And in the meantime, please remember, you can find us on our other platforms. Um, uh, Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Bit Rockfin, and Telegram. And you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. And by going to our shop and buying the things that you will find there, our mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.